joining us as we continue with our Sunday study. We've looked into the book of Nehemiah. And we gave you some of the background last week and studied a little bit about how Ezra and Nehemiah perhaps may have been all together as one writing or one book in some of the earlier uh, times of scripture and, and earlier times of the Bible. But we have them separated here as two different books, but very interconnected in the story that they tell. So would you pray with me? Almighty God, certainly you are one who keeps your covenant and your steadfast love for us endures forever. So be with us as we look at that covenant relationship with you, how you express it here through Nehemiah and all the tasks that are set before him and your people as they return from exile to reestablish themselves in Jerusalem. Help us understand how we are called as well to rebuild our lives at times and to reestablish our relationship with you each and every day for Jesus' sake. Amen. So Nehemiah chapters 1 and 2, we're going to look at the first section of the book. And Nehemiah, as we looked at the background, we've studied all that, but Nehemiah himself really doesn't give us much of that background. He just sort of jumps right into the story. And as we look at these first two chapters, we're going to look at several sections of them, probably four major sections and how he divides them up. And the first section is what we might call the, the crisis. Nehemiah is a cupbearer for the king. It starts out the words of Nehemiah, son of Hekeliah, in the month of Kislev in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province and are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. Its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and I fasted. So we get right away, we jump right in to this story. He's cupbearer, which is perhaps a prominent position among the king, a trusted position. He's the one who tests the food and tastes the wine and, and the, the king's life is in his very hands. So it's a relationship that you want to have with someone you trust, even though Nehemiah is not uh, Persian or with the Medes and Persians here in, in the capital city of Susa. He's not one of them. He's a foreigner by trade or by ethnic group, but apparently has worked his way in as someone very trusted by the king. To be the cupbearer is a fairly high position for someone who is uh, not of their same ethnic background. And again, the king is putting his very life at times in his hands. So in Nehemiah's fellow Jews who returned to Jerusalem are, are in trouble according to what he hears. Uh, their city's walls still broken down and from the start it's Nehemiah's focus uh, not just on the city itself but on the people. How are my people doing? Remember we said that now, when the Assyrians took over, they took some people into captivity. The Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar took more. And now that the Medes and Persians have conquered all those previous empires, the position of their kings has been, why do we need all these people in our land? If they want to go back to their land, if they want to go back to their home, let them go. In fact, when Zerubbabel, with the first return, went, the Nebuchadnezzar had taken many things from the temple when he told stored and when he tore it down, uh, and the king says, hey, here's some stuff out of our treasure that were taken by Nebuchadnezzar, take them back with you to go reestablish your temple and to rebuild your worship centers. Uh, so we see this idea of a, of a crisis. Um, Nehemiah really doesn't introduce himself at first, but he gives us the problem right away. Now, here I am, the words of Nehemiah in this month of Kislev, I heard from Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah, and told me all these things that are very bad. So um, even though he could tell us more about himself and give us a little background like some of the other uh, writers of scripture do, he says there's, there's sort of bigger things going on. There's more important things going on than knowing who I am, uh, which is sort of the second section that we see. His whole prayerful response to all this. He says, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept for some days. I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God in heaven. So here's part of his prayer. O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant who's praying before you day and night 
for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We've acted very wickedly toward you. We've not obeyed the commands and the decrees and the laws that you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, if you're unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even you and even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I've chosen as the dwelling for my name. They are your servants, your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant, to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name, and give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. Then he adds, I was cupbearer to the king. So an interesting prayer, because notice how first of all he starts with his whole full Old Testament background. It's like Nehemiah knows the whole history of the people of Israel and what some of the struggles have been. The word of God was given them through Moses and he prays on the basis of that word. He says, I know, and God, you certainly know how many times we broke that word and we broke those promises and we disobeyed your commands and, and we did all the things that were really not what we should have done. He says, remember, I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. Very wickedly we've, asked, we've acted against you by pursuing other gods, by disobeying your... He goes through the whole sort of understanding of that history. He knows it. He prays it to the God who gave it all. And he repents. He says here, I'm sorry. I, I confess the sins that we have done. Myself, my, my father's house, and perhaps all the people of Israel he's trying to include in here. You know, what a perhaps corrective for our prayers that often are very shallow compared to what he's praying here often surface level compared to what he's praying here. Apparently this period of seeking God in prayer was also quite a period of time. He's praying for favor. Well, where's the favor and what's that about? Well, he wants to go to the king. His plan is ultimately to go to the king to ask if he can go back and be part of what's going on. And, and, and that's you know what this prayer is all about. It lasts for quite a while, which kind of brings us to the, the third section uh, it seems like it's four months or so before he actually gets to go in. Chapter 2 says, In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, Why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid. But I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? So the king said, well, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servants found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my fathers are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked me, well, how long will the journey take and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates, so they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the king's forest, so he'll give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple, and for the city wall and the residence I will occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was upon me, the king granted my requests. So here we see again Nehemiah's wise plan in response to this crisis. He's prayed to God. God perhaps has spoken to him about all this plan. And four months later, growing out of all these months of praying, finally an opportunity prevents itself. And in this sort of dramatic scene, as this opportunity presents itself, he speaks to the king. Nehemiah was quick to clarify. And notice what it's all about. He comes in and the king says, you usually don't look so depressed. You look kind of down today. What's going on? What's making you so down? And so Nehemiah speaks up. Well, why shouldn't I be? I've heard my people are really having struggles and challenges and they haven't rebuilt the walls of their temple and, and, and the city is in ruins and the gates have been destroyed by fire. 
So again, there must be a trusting relationship here. Think of God's hand in all this story. First of all, to place Nehemiah in this position as cupbearer, in this trusted position in the hands of the king. Sort of like the story of Esther when we say, who knows if this is why you were put in this position. So to grant him the king's favor, to grant him the king's ear. So he's bold to say, well, the king says, what do you want? Well, then again, he says, I prayed. So he's involved in prayer again. And I answered the king, well, let me go. Let me go help. And again, think of some of the wisdom of Nehemiah's response here. It tells us in the beginning, he was, he was a little bit afraid. He says, I, I was afraid to really know what was going to happen. But he keeps praying and carries out what some say is a fairly well-conceived, even a little bold plan. From his sad face to the uh, careful wording, he seems like he's got a very detailed proposal here for the king. Let me go. And in fact, here's what might be helpful. And notice the queen's response. Uh, well, how long is this going to take, do you think? How long will you be away? So that's, again, they trust this relationship they have with Nehemiah as this cupbearer. And he's got this proposal, which he delivers with a sort of grace and a sort of humility and clarity we gather here. He's not delivering it with some kind of impassioned, reckless, nervous plea. But he says, let me go. And in fact, if you're going to let me go, hey, it might be helpful to have these letters, trans-Euphrates, part of that area between where he is in Susa and going back to the, to the promised land where God's people are. Give me some letters of travel so people will know that I'm doing this with your blessing because, again, he's a foreigner traveling through these lands. And it might even be helpful. Give me a letter to Asaph, who's the keeper of your forest. Maybe I can bring some equipment and some supplies back with me. If you give me that letter, I know he'll do it. He'll fix it all up. He'll cut me the beams and he'll prepare the things I need. So a lot of really thoughtful preparation going into all this. So really sort of a wise plan of response. For Nehemiah, faith in the Lord calls for this response that's wise and purposeful. And God perhaps was very active and involved in giving him that response. If it pleases the king, can I have letters for travel? If it pleases the king, how about a letter to Asaph to get me some supplies? Give me timber to make beams for the gates in the citadel and for the city wall. And because the gracious hand of my God was upon me, the king granted my requests. So here we see this kind of wise plan and this development of all that, and God sees to it that it happens. And the little fourth section that's here is then Nehemiah's sort of active response. So notice, beginning at verse 9, it says, <clears throat> So I went to the governor of Trans-Euphrates and gave him the king's letters. The king had also sent army officers and cavalry with me. When Sambalat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few men. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night I went out through the valley gate toward the jackal well and the dung gate examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through. So I went up the valley by night examining the wall. Finally I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or any priests or nobles or officials or any others who'd be doing the work. Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins. Its gates have been burned by fire. Come, let's rebuild the wall, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God upon me and what the king had said to me. Well, they replied, Let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. But when Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite, Official, the Ammonite official and Geshem the Arab heard about it. They mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you are doing? They asked. Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, The God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. So now this scene kind of shifts. No longer preparation, getting everything ready and doing all the traveling. Now the real thing begins to set in. It's suddenly on the ground, about a thousand mile journey perhaps from where he was to where he wanted to be. 
And with Nehemiah arriving in Jerusalem and ready to go to work, his leadership is not abstract or, or distant. He's up the middle. Gets up late at night and wants to go check out what everything looks like. And it says he took a few men with him and didn't tell anyone what was on his heart to do. But let's just survey the thing. Let's look at what the situation is all about. Let's see what I've really got to deal with here. So it says by night he went through and it describes the various gates and the, around the city where he went to see what had been broken down. In some places it says so much rubble and so much broken down, enough room for his mount. So he's got to do it on foot, kind of wander through and get different views of things so he can see what really the situation is. So he's up in inspecting the broken down walls, clearly listening to God's direction, right in the middle of the fray addressing both the people who do the work and some of these who are going to try and stop him. Some of these people are saying, what are you doing here? Why are you wanting to rebuild this? This is kind of our land and our place right now. And all in all, he's, he, he's telling of God's hand and God's faithfulness and God's call to him. That's how he explains it to the people. You see the trouble we're in, he says. But I also told them about the gracious hand of my God upon me and what the king had said to me. Because that carried a lot of weight. I even got letters from the king and support from the king. He provided all this equipment for us to use. and Just a lot of different things about his relationship. So with God's hand on him, he responds very actively. So part of our inspiration, part of what we learn here in the midst of our crises of today is that Nehemiah can inspire us to respond. To respond prayerfully. To respond actively. To respond wisely to every crisis and all the things that may be going on in our life. And maybe first and foremost, Nehemiah inspires us to look to God, to turn our situations over to him constantly and consistently in prayer. So even in the midst of the challenges of a virus, even in the midst of the challenges of the violence and, and oppression and other things that may be going on around us, we can seek God's guidance and in God's mercy we can respond to him in the ways Nehemiah does. Uh, maybe with some encouragement and some support. And, uh, Nehemiah's faith continues to rest on God, who's working consistently in him and through him, and I trust in us and through us to show his plan of redemption to all the people who are involved and engaged. And, and in Christ the Lord, we can know that, that, that through the gates of all this city, eventually that he's wanting to rebuild, will walk the Son of God. And that's the Son of God who really has made us acceptable to God. Nothing we've done ourselves, nothing we earn or we deserve. Uh, so as we take a look at all these things, we can celebrate God's goodness to Nehemiah and to us as well. He's a fascinating combination here as we look at this section and as we'll see in the rest of his book of, of utter humility and yet some pretty bold confidence in the power and presence of God with him. So may that be uh, us as well, living with humility and living with confidence that God is with us and directing all the things that go on in our lives for the overall good of his kingdom. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, we rejoice that you were with Nehemiah and that you gave permission through the king and, and all the various ways you blessed his activity that he could now go back and help the people of God rebuild the walls of your city and restore their faith. And, and we'll take a look more at how that happens in the coming weeks. But may we turn to you consistently and constantly to be acting in that humility of faith that is ours, as well as that confidence of faith that is ours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.